four by five or eight by 10? Which should I shoot? Is eight by 10 really that much better than four by five? In this video, I'll concisely compare these two popular formats so that you can make the best decision possible for your photographic process. Large format photography is all about the choices. There's the film selection, color or black and white, web plate, paper negative. What about the lens selection? Traditional barrel lens or a modern shutter lens element combination. Then there's the type of camera, monorail or field camera. And of course, what size, four by five or eight by 10? Or dare I even mention ultra large format, like a ridiculously huge 16 by 20? Whoa! <sighs> if you're feeling overwhelmed now, then pause and take a deep breath. This video will hopefully help you. Just be sure to watch it from start to finish so you don't miss anything important. The foundation for deciding what the optimal size of the format you want to shoot is rooted in differentiating the intricacies of each respective format and not the bigger is better mindset. My rationale for this is the fact that no matter what size you choose, 4x5, 8x10, or even 16x20, the mechanical operation of these cameras is identical. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't any niche aspects of each format that you would need to consider. It just means that there is a high transfer of perfunctory skills related to camera operation. It's like driving a car. Once you learn how to drive one, then you can pretty much drive them all. <laughs> I just need to figure out that self park feature. <laughs> I think it's important to note that I started my large format journey on four x five, then transitioned to eight by 10 with a short stint of six by 17 somewhere in the middle. While I've tried to remain as objective as possible, some of my considerations on my list come from my personal experiences with shooting both of these formats since I began shooting in 2009. So how do I figure out what size is right for me? What I've done is concisely organize my comparisons of the 4x5 and 8x10 formats into five categories to make it easier to analyze. Those categories being cost, portability, gear, technical advantage, and technical disadvantage. Under each of those categories are individual points related to the respective format. I've listed the categories in decreasing order of consideration for each of the formats. For me, if I was going to start over, I would look at the most impactful considerations first, followed by lesser items on the list. But that's just my viewpoint. You can change the order to suit your particular situation. Let's kick things off with cost. This is definitely a top consideration for most of us who are not independently wealthy and fund our photography by working an ordinary full-time job. It may go without saying, but as you move from the 4x5 to the 8x10 format, the cost increases significantly. For example, a Chamonix 45N1 Classic costs $1,075, while the 810 Alpinus Convertible X camera will set you back $5,600 in 2024. If you haven't seen my video on the Alpinus X camera, I'll leave a link to it in the description. You may be saying, but what about Intrepid's 8x10? That's only $616 for the plywood version. Yes, indeed it is. However, the plywood 4x5 version is only $388. That's still a $228 difference. But wait, there's also the difference in price for the film holders, film, lenses, and even the dark cloth. Let me back up a second here. Have you checked the price difference in film yet? Let me spoil the sticker shock. A box of 4x5 Portra 160 is $64.95, while an 8x10 box costs $279.95 at B&H Photo. That's a 77% increase in cost. Did I mention that a box only has 10 sheets in it? Yeah, that's $28 per 8x10 sheet. <laughs> The take home message is that you need to closely evaluate your budget and decide how much disposable income you're willing to spend on large format. 
I would suggest running the numbers before setting yourself up for disappointment. The next consideration that I would look at is portability. Are you going to be backpacking for days or even weeks and need to carry food and water plus your ridiculously huge camera gear? <laughs> I think it almost goes without saying that the 4x5 format takes the prize when it comes to being less bulky, easier to pack, and in general, lighter weight. There are exceptions. For example, older field cameras like the Zone 6 Studios 4x5 version weighs in at a hefty 6.6 .6 pounds. In comparison, my Chamonix 8x10 Alpinus X convertible camera only weighs 6.9 pounds. They're just about identical. We know who's staying home on a long hike. If you need something lighter, Intrepid's Plywood 4x5 version remarkably weighs just under 3 pounds. Ultimately, you have to decide how you'll be using your camera to determine the level of portability that you need. If you're only doing studio work, then a nice behemoth of a monorail system like the Scene RP2 tops the list because of the versatility, precision, and ability to use both 4x5 and 8x10 formats as part of the same unit. But Tony, what about those of us who like to fly around the world? Can I really do that with an 8x10? The short answer is yes. Just keep in mind that you more than likely will have to check your camera case, but it can be done securely with a little bit of preparation. Here's a snapshot of how I traveled to Europe with my Zone 6 Studios 8x10 version in 2018. But that's a discussion topic for another video. If you're not comfortable checking your camera case and want to bring it on the airplane as a carry-on, then 4x5 is great. You can easily get all your gear into a pack that meets the airline regulations for size. So when it comes to portability, think about how you'll be using the camera and how you'll be transporting the camera to your shooting locations. I think that's a really important part of your decision-making process. Let's move on to the gear. We all love that, don't we? If you want the most options and availability for camera types from compact to studio sizes and a wide gamut of lenses, the clear-cut winner is going to be the 4x5 format. The focal length variety alone seems just about limitless with ranges from 47 millimeters all the way up to 1200 millimeters. In the 35 millimeter format, that's the equivalent angle of view from about 12 to 300 millimeters. That's an incredible selection of modern focal lengths. In contrast, the 8x10 focal length availability ranges from about 120 millimeters to 1200 millimeters or 17 to 166 millimeters in the 35 millimeter angle of view equivalent. The 8x10 focal lengths don't sound all that limiting until you compare the individual focal lengths available. There are only 18 modern focal lengths to choose from in the 8x10 format in comparison with the 36 focal lengths available for 4x5. That's double the amount of choices we have. That can be frustrating or beneficial depending upon how you view choices and limitations. For what it's worth, I've never been bothered by the differences between these formats in terms of focal length choices. If you're like me and don't care about focal length selection, then maybe it's all about the accessories available for these formats. For example, some 4x5 cameras have what's known as an international back or graphlock back. This attachment mechanism enables the use of roll film holders like a 6x7, 6x9, 6x12, or 6x17 back that increases the variety and aspect ratios available to the photographer. It is noteworthy that some camera manufacturers make 8x10 to 4x5 reducing backs that have a graph lock back, so this isn't necessarily a limitation of owning an 8x10 camera. However, that does increase the bulk and weight you're carrying around just to shoot a smaller format. On a positive note, for many of the lenses that cover 8x10, you can mount them to a Linhoff Technica or Wister style lens board, which are smaller, and then use a lens board adapter on your 8x10 camera to save space in your pack. In addition, lenses that cover 8x10 can always be used on smaller formats, so there's no need to have two sets of lenses unless there's a particular focal length you prefer. 
This all goes back to how important is portability to you. There's one more accessory available for 4x5 that I think is worth mentioning here, and that is the Reflex Viewer. While I've never used one before, it basically attaches to the graph lock back and corrects the image from being upside down and backwards and allows you to look through an optical viewfinder to make it easier to compose and focus. Maybe that could be a deciding factor. Again, I don't own one, so I can't speak to the benefits of having that piece of gear. If you've used a reflex viewer, please share your experience with all of us in the comments so that everyone can benefit from your wisdom. What about those of us that use a darkroom? Which format is better? Well, from what I hear and have observed, 8x10 enlargers are about as rare as unicorns. Okay, maybe not that extreme, but good luck in trying to source one. There are far more 4x5 enlargers available, so if traditional darkroom printing is your passion, then maybe 4x5 is the right format for you. But Tony, what about contact printing with 8x10? Yes indeed, many photographers love contact printing, which frees you from having expensive and hard to find equipment taking up all your valuable darkroom space. Ah, <sighs> decisions decisions. As I mentioned earlier, the mechanical operation of large format cameras is essentially identical no matter what size you choose. However, there are some technical differences that might persuade you in the direction of 4x5 versus 8x10. So let's take a closer look at the technical advantages of each of these formats. If you've ever wanted to be free of a tripod so you can shoot handheld, but want the benefits of sheet film, then 4x5 is definitely the way to go. There are press cameras like the Linhoff Technica and Graphlix Speed Graphic that give you the ability to do this, just like the press photographer Ouija did during the 1930s and 1940s. Just keep in mind that you are still going to need to be cognizant of shutter speed and motion blur, as well as the depth of field. Speaking of apertures, in general, 4x5 lenses tend to have larger maximum apertures, so smaller f-stop numbers, which is advantageous because the ground glass is brighter, subsequently making it easier to focus. For those of you who enjoy background blur, that also may be a welcome advantage. Another consideration that isn't a huge deal, at least for me, is that loading 4x5 film into the holders is a little easier, especially if you're using a changing bag in comparison with 8x10. Larger pieces of sheet film flex a little bit more, and that sometimes can make sliding the film into the grooves of the film holder a little tedious because you can't guide both sides of the film with one hand. Unless, of course, you have pituitary gigantism, then maybe you'd have an easier time loading 8x10 film. You could also make the argument that 4x5 is a little bit faster to use, but I haven't found that to be a significant difference after some practice in the field in comparison with 8x10. That might be more related to maximum lens apertures and ground glass differences. Since I mentioned the ground glass, I have found that it is easier to compose and focus on a bigger ground glass, at least for me and my eyesight, especially with wide angle lenses. The 8x10 size is more like reading a magazine, which I connect with better. But again, this isn't a consideration that would persuade me in either direction. Last fall in Zion National Park, I chose to exclusively shoot my 4x5 camera because I have about 40 sheets of Velvia 100 left that expired in 2015 and that I'd like to expose. The point being is that I never felt limited by the ground glass size in composing and focusing even though I yearned to shoot with my 8x10 camera. Do you feel my pain? The other item related to the ground glass is that some folks say that it is easier to see the camera movements on the bigger ground glass. Again, that is certainly valid, but not necessarily something that would convince me to choose one format over another. Having good eyesight and the proper prescription for your reading glasses goes a long way in this department. Okay, I know, you are all probably waiting for me to talk about the elephant in the room that is the resolution difference between 4x5 and 8x10. 
Just keep in mind that I have shot both formats and have made ridiculously huge prints from my 4x5 and 8x10 negatives. Are you ready for this next statement? 8x10 film has the technical advantage on this one. It's four times the surface area of a 4x5 piece of film, so I think it goes without saying that the resolution is better, assuming you've executed all the technical aspects correctly. Now that doesn't mean that 4x5 is garbage and not worth shooting. On the contrary, if you make prints that are conventionally sized, like a 16x20, you will be blown away by how sharp and detailed your images can turn out. This image of the starfish printed incredibly well despite coming from a puny little piece of 4x5 film. Seriously, it's beautiful and no one will ever say to you that it would look better if you had used 8x10 film. Ever. At least I wouldn't. The real advantage of the higher resolution from 8x10 film comes from when you print ridiculously huge like I enjoy doing. I can tell you that when I compare the differences between two of my ridiculously huge prints from a piece of 4x5 film and 8x10 film, there is a noticeable difference. But these are prints that are 60 or more inches on the long side. Are you going to be printing this big? That's a question you need to ask yourself. The short of it is that if you are making conventional enlargements, then 4x5 is more than enough. But bigger prints definitely benefit from the 8x10 size. And let's not forget about the viewing distance because that also affects our perception of sharpness and detail. The closer you get, the more benefit there is to a higher resolution image. From a darkroom perspective, if you are making contact prints, then 8x10 film also has the advantage because arguably an 8x10 print is a great size for viewing. I think it's important to note that both 4x5 and 8x10 make amazing contact prints with incredible detail and sharpness. You really can't go wrong in the darkroom with either format. The one last technical advantage that is somewhat contentious is that of increased tonal range with 8x10 film. Think about this. The larger the surface area available for exposure means the more gradations in tone that you'll be able to record because it's being spread out over a much larger space. That was actually one of the first observations I made once I started viewing my 8x10 slides on a light table. The images have a more gradual and soft transition among the colors. It's not a huge difference, but it is noticeable, especially when you've experienced both formats. So if you only shoot 4x5, you won't miss it. It's only if you transition or downsize in formats that you'll notice. What about the technical disadvantages? There's really only one technical disadvantage I've heard of for 4x5 that relates more to photographers using the alternative processes instead of film. Smaller wet or dry plates, cyanotypes, or paper negatives may not yield the most satisfying results because of the large effort needed to make these kinds of prints. In other words, is it really worth all that work to make such a small print? I don't use alternative processes, so you are better served by asking someone who has tried a variety of sizes using these techniques. I wouldn't recommend basing your decision on your preferred format based solely upon my limited information of alternative processes. If anyone has experience using alternative processes, please share your experience in the comments for the benefit of everyone. Unlike 4x5 film, the list of technical disadvantages for 8x10 is a bit longer. Bigger format equals bigger problems. One of the major considerations is that the depth of field for an 8x10 camera is narrower compared with 4x5. Subsequently, that means using smaller apertures, so larger f-stop numbers, to compensate for some of this difference. The problem with using smaller apertures is that you'll increase the contribution of diffraction, which makes an image softer. If you want to see how I achieve a balance between depth of field and aperture, I'll leave a link to that video in the description. You'll also find now that in order to maintain a given angle of view, you have to increase the focal length. 
So if you like the look of a wide angle 75 millimeter lens on 4x5, you'll need to consider one of the limited selections of wide angle lenses in the 150 to 165 millimeter range that have an image circle capable of covering an 8x10 piece of film. As you may have guessed it, these lenses are pricey. Additionally, lenses typically have smaller maximum apertures as they increase in focal length, generally speaking. So get ready for a dim and challenging viewing experience on the ground glass. If you like macro photography, then watch out. The closer the lens is to the subject, the more bellows you'll need. You might find out that some focal lengths may not work with the length of bellows your camera has. This is where a monorail system like a Cinar P2 comes in handy so that you can add additional sections of bellows to make a ridiculously huge camera. That camera would definitely stay in the studio for me. How about unintentional double images appearing on your film? Say what? <laughs> One of the problems that is magnified with bigger film is that of the film shifting around or bowing within the film holder during the exposure, especially with long exposures. The theory is that the temperature and or humidity within the camera affect the film flatness while the film is being exposed to light. The ambient air difference between the film holder's smaller surface area with the dark slide removed and the larger surface area of the interior of the camera may result in the film flexing into slightly different positions. The end result being areas of the film that take on a double image appearance and not in focus, particularly towards the edges of the image. You may have heard this being referred to as film pop. While I don't recall this being a serious problem for me, to prevent this, I just tap the film holder on the side that will be positioned towards the base of the camera. Film flatness, however, can be a serious problem when you try to use a flatbed scanner for 8x10 film. The only solution to this problem that worked for me prior to getting a drum scanner was that of taping my film to a large piece of old scanner glass. With the emulsion side in contact with the glass, it seemed to work fine without introducing all those pesky Newton rings. If I was flatbed scanning today, I would purchase a wet mounting film holder and just use that to get the benefits of a wet mounting process. If you are interested in learning about the supplies necessary to safely wet mount and scan your film, I'll leave a link to that video in the description as well as an Amazon link to an example of the wet mounting holder. Man, that's a lot to consider. Even as I was preparing for this video, I thought, how the heck am I going to make this concise, organized, and manageable for viewer consumption? That's when I decided that maybe a good old fashioned table could do the job. So here it is, my reference table with the categories I thought were the most important, as well as the respective individual points to consider for shooting 4x5 and 8x10 formats. You might want to consider pausing the video here and taking a screenshot for a better look at this summary. By the way, in case you didn't notice, my video follows each of these columns and points in succession. In conclusion, it's really up to you as the photographer as to the weight of importance that you assign to each of these categories and respective individual points I've presented in this video. Your table may look different than mine, and that's okay. Photography has to be individualized to suit the needs of the photographer. That sometimes means trial and error, trying different gear, or changing formats. When I finished taking my large format photography class at Appalachian State University with Professor John Scarlatta, I wanted to move up in format size and I almost purchased an 8x10 Deardorff field camera in lieu of my 4x5 Zone 6 Studios camera. The decision I made was based purely on movement differences and physical condition between the two cameras I was considering. In retrospect, I wish I had a repository of information like I've presented in this video to help me in my decision making. Luckily, it all worked out for me and I had lots of practice making bad images on 4x5 before I started spending more money with my 8x10. Not to mention that along my journey and transition in formats, I've managed to take a few images that I'm actually proud of. So hopefully you found my video helpful. If you did, 
please hit the like button and consider subscribing if you haven't already done so. Together, we can make this channel ridiculously huge. As always, thanks for watching.